I want to welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out for the second episode or edition uh, of our Connect Against Conversation conversation on the Emperor of All Maladies. Uh, tonight, I also want to welcome everybody who is meeting with us online. It looks like we've got Mark, Lori, and that's Kathy. Okay, I'm Julie Husband, and uh, want to make sure that online people uh, are uh, have got their audio on and uh, video on for now. You can turn off your video for large group sessions, but uh, you'll probably want to turn that on for small chats. Um, okay, and make sure that your microphones have been muted. Uh, unless you're planning to, to speak. Um, and then I want to introduce our facilitators for today. Uh, we've got Beth Drellick, who uh, is here with us all the way from South Carolina. She, well, not just for tonight. Not just for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> she moved here to Iowa. How long ago? Uh, 13. 2013. 2013. Uh, she comes to the organization having been diagnosed with stage two breast cancer in March of 2016. She finished her chemotherapy in November of 2016 and was a two year survivor. <laughs> she credits 3D uh, mammography for saving her life. She'd like to consider uh, a little bit more insurance company policies on. 3D mammography. Um, she is a social worker uh, and is a, a new member of the Caribbean team. Right, just year. a few months. Last week, I think. Good. And our other facilitator is Jackie Baker. She has been a nurse for 27 years. That's impressive. Uh, she was diagnosed with two positive breast cancers at age 46. Uh, she benefited from breakthrough target therapy called Perceptin, which is a treatment specific to her type of cancer. She is now an eight-year survivor. Wow. In 2011, after all treatment was completed, her cancer journey took her to monthly Beyond Pink team meetings, and she got she became a member of the organization. Uh, she tells me that she has found the support volunteer opportunities, education, and advocacy opportunities to be very valuable. Uh, she's also a member of the National Breast Cancer Coalition. Uh, and through the National Breast Cancer Coalition, she has been to Washington four times. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so they, they host advocacy summits in Washington, D.C. And she's also lobbied Capitol Hill for breast cancer research and her health care for all. She says that being part of the Beyond Pink team has been a positive experience. She can't imagine how thankful they are to have done that. Both Jackie and Beth are hosting. OK, I have, let's see, technological. Do we have technological discussion? I do not. Well, I'm small group discussion. Do we all see our names? Yeah, we'd like the participants to introduce yourselves okay. and uh, tell us why you're here tonight. Start here in the corner. Yeah. My name is Joey Fuller, and I'm just here just because it seemed interesting. And this is a fun group of people. And it's really why. Um, Dean Hughes, I'm not a survivor, but I've been with the on PT for um, almost 29 years now. And um, I just want to learn as much as I can about cancer. I worked in mammography when I was working as a radiology technologist, and so I find it uh, interesting. I'm BFW, and I'm here because I'm interested in the history of biography of cancer and information about it. I'm Christine Carpenter, and um, I'm a member of the Beyond Pink team and um, the United Cancer Conversation um, group um, and the National Breast Cancer Coalition. Um, I, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1993, and so far, I'm, I'm doing fine. Um, I, too, think, I, too, um, um, feel like public policy is 
really important for Emily to rest in her and for them we need to hopefully and the awe family. And um, this book is a wonderful, I think it's a wonderful way to find, hear about the uh, autobiography of the biography of cancer, but not only the science, but there's politics involved with cancer. And uh, it does a good job of uh, talking about the pol uh, public policy issues surrounding cancer. Um, I'm Rhonda Shaw, and I'm going on uh, about 10 years as a colon cancer I think we have to speak up because the unit is here, uh, just so that those online can hear. I'm Catherine Zeman, and I'm a professor at UNI in Environmental Health, so I'm concerned about environmental exposure from chronic disease and cancer. But I've also had many members of my family touched by cancer and friends, and so it's you know something that is definitely uh, something that I think that we could have a better conversation about nationally and, and find a better preventive means of limiting the number of people that have to deal with cancer. And I think it's an important um, conversation that we need to have yet in society. Melanie Belsky, and I, March 3rd, four years ago, I had my mammogram and found out I had two different kinds of cancer at the same time. I was perceptive. I have an ATR2 positive on one side and an estrogen on the other side. So uh, the doctor knew but had never seen that before. So I, I've learned, my, I go to St. John for the support group over there and they are a fabulous group over there. I have a, somebody from our group who actually has joined a uh, she did when they went up to Mayo and she did some vaccines, like on the ATR2 vaccine. She was part of a study. So she kind of gets us all revved up on different issues too. So I'm Joy Thorson and uh, I'm an 18 year survivor. Rest in <laughs> um, however, this past year I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. So um, I'm going through some chemotherapy again, my 10 month of, of pill, my new pill that just went out. So anyway, but I'm doing really well. So I, I'm very positive. And we're going to hold it <laughs> I'm here because I really want to become an advocate. I, I kind of ventured into a little bit thought process last year, and it wasn't the right timing. But um, I want to know more. I want to be knowledgeable. I want to keep, I want to help people not have to Uh, I'm Devina Lachman. I've been a member of the Young Geek team for, I think, for about a year now. And I found this book really interesting, finding out about where we come for cancer and research. I've already introduced myself. I'm Julie. I'm a mom. And, um, and I'm very interested with family and friends in cancer and cancer research. And I'm delighted to be part of the Young Geek team. Um, I'm Gauri. I'm going to be behind the scenes running the camera, um, but hello. I can't see you. I know. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> hello, everyone. And then, Brinton, I'm going to turn the camera to you so that the people can see who's working hard behind the scenes. Uh, if I can, can I get it? 
Yes. Uh, first of all, can you hear me okay? This is yeah, Mark. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I turned off my video. As you can see that. Oh. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Um, about a month ago, uh, I was talking with Dr. Zeman, and she mentioned that this series um, on this book was going to be done. And uh, I was interested because I, I like this format for learning. Uh, that's primarily why I wanted to do it. But I also have a son who's a radiation oncologist and I wanted to better understand this, this whole thing of cancer because in looking back in my family's history on my side, I have no cancer. Uh, if you were talking heart disease, uh, I, all my family has passed because of heart disease. Um, so it, it, I've started reading the book a little late, but I really have enjoyed what I've read because I like the approach that the author has used uh, to make points and uh, to travel through time to explain how this is all proceeded and developed. I, I just think it's a very well-written book. So I'm here to, to listen and participate where I can. And I am Lori. Can you hear me okay or should I mute my video? We can hear you. You're good. Okay. Um, so I am here because I am a breast cancer survivor and I have learned so incredibly much about cancer, um, but I realize even more after reading this book um, at what the challenge is to, um, to actually bring an end to cancer. There's so much more involved than any of us could ever have imagined. And, and so whatever role we can play, I want to be part of that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we're going to get started with the small group breakouts. Uh, Jackie and I worked on chapters two and three. Chapter two is entitled Impatient War, and part three was Will You Turn Me Out If I Can't Get Better? So that's where we focused our questions for tonight. The first small group question that I'm going to read you the introduction and then I'll read you the question. And then technology wise, the muting will begin. If you could break out at the tables you're sitting at and discuss it, when we, we'll do the first question, then we'll all come back and each table and a small group of Mark and Lori, I guess is a small group, mm -hmm. um, will talk about the discussion you all had about it. Uh, we invite Differencing opinions, challenging each other, um, looking at it from a different angle. Uh, this is not a, um, where Jackie and I are going to grade you on your answer. <laughs> this is absolutely for intellectual stimulation. So I will read you my introduction to the first question. Anybody who does this, trying to narrow down just a few questions when you have these incredible chapters, I tell you, it was very difficult, so bear with us as we try to do the best we can. Um, introduction. Min Chi Li, excuse me if I'm pronouncing that probably terribly, was a Chinese-American oncologist and cancer researcher. I hope you all had these questions ahead of time, so it'll be easier for you. He was the first to use chemotherapy to cure widely metastatic malignant cancer. He had stumbled on a deep and fundamental principle of oncology, cancer, which is cancer needed to be systematically treated along after every visible sign of it had been. The strategy which cost him his job resulted in the first chemotherapeutic cure for cancer in adults. That's the introduction. The question I posed was that he was accused of experimenting on people and Freilich said, but of course all of us were exper experimenting. To not experiment would mean to follow the old rules to do absolutely nothing. And then I decided where you could look at that. Do you think police actions were ethical? How can doctors and scientists draw the line between reckless, unproven treatment and unnecessary experimentation for drug development? I'll tell you why I picked this question out of all of them. If I think now in hindsight, we say the experimentation was needed because I don't know, I've 
benefited from chemotherapy, and I'm sure the women who, or people who went before me had a much harder time, and I benefited from that. But we have the benefit of hindsight. I can't imagine in the moment the doctors having to figure this out and look at the patients. So that's why I chose that question. So we're going to now break, break into the small groups, and you guys discuss the ethical dilemma uh, it, it cost him his job. We need to go and get a history about it, but it's not as to where we are today. So, if you all can hear, let's break down into the small groups, discuss, and then we'll give you about a minute's notice when we're going to wrap up, and then we can talk about this question. Thank you. One lucky person could be a spokesperson, or if you all can join, but we'd like to hear a table discussion on where this question took you uh, and any general thoughts or um, conclusions about it. Can Mark and Lori, can you hear us? Okay, um, we'll move on then and we'll do start with the back table. You guys want to start and have someone represent? <laughs> well, the question kind of took us, I'll, I'll you guys chime in. Um, the question kind of took us to talk about how the progression from the extreme radical mastectomy, where it just kept getting more and more and more and more and more. And eventually they came to the conclusion, I think a lot through to me, was that the cells may have just, they didn't just grow and grow and grow off of the central nucleus. Perhaps the cells, the cancer cell, had gone off somewhere else before they started cutting away. So that's kind of what we were talking about um, how that changed and as far as the <clears throat> ethical dilemma I, mean, I almost felt that we had a sense of urgency he knew what he wanted as a result and yes those were numbers but he knew that he really felt that if he would keep trying one more thing one more thing that he would help us so you know i really felt he felt a sense of urgency specifically Plus, he was working with the numbers. He wanted the numbers, but that was the person's survival. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was a person as well as the numbers. Thank you very much. Okay, table, uh, first table. I'm a camera. So, you can tell your experiences. Well, we were just, the arts kind of went along the lines, the same lines that we thought that. It was not that whole that he really wanted to help those people in the moment. He saw when it died in front of his eyes and he knew. And he, he was very sorry to realize that he had to follow those numbers to stay on his team that day. So he really had, oh, he really had a, a, a brilliant insight and did it. And as someone here said, if you were diagnosed with cancer and you don't know if you're going to survive, you'll pretty much try anything to live. That was anyway. And, um, you know, I, when I think about everything she did and, and you know, what, what started her, her um, journey, like towards saying something has got to be changed, you know, and it, it started maybe with the absence of medical remedies against her parents' condition and illness that left her resentful because they they were both they both died when she was fairly young. And it you know, and then she had some own illnesses and that kind of pushes you and you kinda of wonder what pushes people to really say, you know, something's gotta happen. And you know, and I've always said, um, I felt kind of guilty that it took me getting cancer to say something's gotta happen because really you, you we should, you know, I should have said that a long time ago. I watched people, you know, lose their children even, and, and I just didn't realize how a, what a difference people can make. And we all make a difference, you know, whether we just volunteer or we give money, you know, whatever. It's all, you know, philanthropic that we do things like that. But my question, or the question is, you know, how did Mary do this? How did she borrow from the world of business, the world of advertising, and even the military to build this nationwide 
um, effort to combat cancer. And then we could also, you know, say how could this happen today to get funding and um, national attention for any kind of cancer. And we can just pick one, you know, we could pick, you know, neuroblastoma, children's cancer that I, I we've had two friends lose our children to that. And it, it was devastating, it still is, it's still devastating. And more, you know, more needs to be done. So that's, that's my question, so gather and talk. Laurie and Mark, now that we have you better, do you want to comment about the first question before we jump into the second one? Um, or we moved on? Well, let's see. Uh, yeah, we can. We can go back, I guess. Uh, I, you know, the one thing, can you hear me now? Yeah, wow. that's great. Whoa, okay. You can't see me, though, can you? <laughs> uh, you know, the, on the first question, I think Lori and I both, you know, certainly agreed on this, that, you know, the, the fact that uh, physicians and doctors at that time had to try new things and to, you know, say that it was unethical, uh, we didn't feel that in any way was it unethical at that time. I don't, can't speak for today all the time because things are very different today than they were at that time in the early 50s. But... Um, you know, the question about being reckless, you know, they had to experiment with different drugs in order to find the right combination. There were a lot of things that had to be done, and, and obviously some people would not be able to benefit from what they did, but others did. Just knowing from what my son has done over the years, and he's done a lot of research, and uh, that does happen. I mean, that's just um, that's part of the process. But that would summarize very quickly, I guess, what we thought. And I'll just jump in and add that um, I think that's what the FDA is all, you know, partly all about is to try to help avoid recklessness with medicine. So, you know, I know that um, we hear a lot from National Breast Cancer Coalition about the importance of evidence-based medicine. And I think that that's something that we need to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Second question. Second question. Open it up to small. No, we're going to do the rest. Like what we just oh, talked yeah. about with Mary. Yeah, everybody report that part of the group. Yeah. You guys want to start? I just need. Oh, Mark and Lori can start. Yeah, go ahead and start with um, section number two. Oh, okay. Uh, well, as far as the second question goes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just making sure. Uh, uh, the whole thing, I think, for Mary, it started out that she be, she was, she and her husband were very influential, and and he was the one I think said to her, like, "Look, there's money out there. We just have to know to go find it, and and where to go." And the first thing they had to do was create the awareness. So, by using Reader's Digest, they were in a way advertising this issue of cancer. And that created the awareness, and through their influential friends, they were able to raise, and the Di Reader's Digest, they were able to raise quite a bit of money very quickly and take it to the next level. So uh, she was smart. She was really a smart and uh, a, a person who was able to use her resources quite effectively. That's a quick summary. Part of it, uh, Lori, anything? No, that was great. Okay, thank you. Group over here. We have a spokesperson. Uh -oh. um, yeah, we, we talked about her background um, coming out of the war in manufacturing and then her father being in advertising and how that influenced her and how she recognized the ability to make connections with um, famous figures like Audrey Hepburn and things like that. And, and just how she can move things out of the academic debate and quagmire that maybe it was stuck in a little bit. And the, the, the organization that had, had hopefully come out of that, which was the American Society for the Control, control. I was going to say containment, you know, control of a completely different marketing approach to that whole issue. To engage 
cooperation with them, uh, the quagmire that had kind of been established with the, um, you know, just the, comp the competition that had existed in that. So um, we felt, felt like um, Mary Lass was very sad. And um, although we noted that back then there weren't quite as many causes as there are today. Um, and um, so it, it seemed like there probably was a little less competition than there is today. Um, but we did agree that they, um, we need to do the same comprehensive approach, um, including social media and all that, if we want to get anything done. And there was kind of some feeling of discouragement in the group, and uh, about because it's so hard, to, you know, the, it, the work is so hard. Um, and so I told I told the group, and I'll try to make it short, uh, about how our group um, helped because we helped. Um, we were instrumental in passing the uh, Breast and Cervical Cancer Treatment Act back in the late 90s. Um, CDC had, had Center for Disease Control had a screening program for breast and cervical cancer, but no treatment for it. And so, um, so the National Breast Cancer Coalition, of which we are a member organization, um, was working on adding a treatment portion to that. So if you're screened and found out breast or cervical cancer, you can be treated. And they needed um, somebody, the person who was going to take it through the finance company, guide the, the, the senator. And so they asked our group to talk to Senator Grassley and, because he had a senior position. And we did meet with him on a cold Friday night in December in his what? Waterloo office. What year? In, I think it was 1998. And uh, we asked him to lead it through the finance committee. <laughs> Didn't agree that night, but he went back and agreed to do it. And so then he worked with the National Breast Cancer Coalition, and the National Breast Cancer Coalition had advocates in you know most of the other states. And so with all the advocates calling their Congress, the folk, and uh, Senator Grassley's leadership, um, he, because he, the, they were in control, um, we got it passed. And so now women um, throughout the United States are able to get um, become Medicaid eligible for their treatment if they're screened through this program. And so I guess what I want to say is we have found that grassroots lobbying really does make a difference. Um, and so I would encourage everybody to join the Breast Cancer Deadline 2020 Action Network. If you will send you an uh, alert and say, call this and say this, <laughs> <laughs> or email this person and say this. And, uh, and it really does make a difference. The loudest voices are the ones that are heard. What is that group again? Iowa Breast Cancer Deadline um, 2020 Action Network on Facebook. It's on Facebook. We've got a link for it. Christine, I have a question for you on that yeah. note. Let's fast forward now, it's 20 years later, yes. 2018. Is there still the advocacy network there? Do you still have Grassley's ears? Is Jody Burns part of this now? I mean, where are we 20 years later? What obstacles do us newbies, what will we be facing? Or what obstacles have you already illuminated for us? <laughs> um, they do know us in the, every office. Um, <laughs> of a, you know, in DC, and we, they know what we're coming for. When we come, we come yearly. And um, so every office knows this. Um, each time there's an election and there are new people, we have to re-educate them. Although we did, um, for one of our priorities, which is the Department of Defense Breast Cancer Research Program, we got all of our new, this was when they were all, when we, there was the election and we had several new congressmen. Um, we got them all on board, Republicans and Democrats, to support that. And now they, in the House, they still, every year um, support it. it. It's a letter that has to be signed every year. And that, on the House side, we do. And um, Senator Grassley, in the past, has signed a letter. Now he's, he doesn't sign a letter, but he sends his own. Not quite as good um, a letter of support for the program. And unfortunately, Joni Ernst, we cannot get her on board. We are trying, 
and we are going, you know, every year and every time we're there, we keep talking to her about it. So we're hoping that we can move her also. What's her apprehension? I mean, how, like, what's her apprehension about being on board? What's her obstacle? Her That's obstacle is she wants to move all, um, all what they call congressionally directed medical research programs, of which the Department of Defense Breast Cancer Research Program is a part. She wants to move all of that to the National Institute of Health. And we know that if it were moved, it would totally dilute the program and it would no longer be the program that it is, which is very innovative. Um, the rating back at the Institute of Medicine, which is a rating that's really important, it gets very high ratings for its um, you know, transparency and its effectiveness and its um, you know, using the money very, very well. And, um, so we keep working on it. So what is it that you want by 2020? Well, by 2020, what we want to do is to know how to end breast cancer by um, preventing it in the first place. And we do have a vaccine to prevent breast cancer that is um, ready to go to clinical trials. And we have a meeting on March, I think it's 15th, with the federal drug, FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, to begin to ask them when can we begin some clinical trials on that. So if you know, that's what we hope to know. And the other thing we're working on that we probably won't achieve by 2020 is how to prevent the test or the spread, which is what kills the test. So that's what we're trying to do with deadline 2020. But we have a plan for after or that we're working on for um, you know how to keep moving this forward. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm just looking at the clock, and we've got one minute. So, anyone have any other comments? Even Lori and Mark, questions, comments? Thank you for seeing that wonderful update. Get us all ignited. Um, anybody else have any thoughts about tonight? Okay, then let's talk about the next time we meet. Uh, it is going to be on March 26th. And it's going to be part four. Prevention is the cure. Right? It's just part four, right? It's part four. So the task that all of us have is that we read up through page three, 393. So that will be on board and that will be a month from now. And then we'll do the same format, but we'll make it better. So if we send out a survey, please let us know how we can make it better. Yeah. For Anton? Mm -hmm. Okay. Three pages. Okay, two weeks right, so four and five next month, the end of March. Okay. But pardon me. And then part six will be with the uh, last part. <clears throat> Who's the uh, presenters for next time? Dee oh, and Lori. Okay. Um, so everyone make sure you enroll, get your reading up, the questions about ahead of time as we did this time. And we welcome my feedback and thank you all for coming and participating and Lori and Mark and Lori with your halo. Uh, <laughs> and thank you guys for all your IT help. Thanks, Jackie and Beth. Thanks a lot for doing it. Thanks for joining us.